Today, we're taking you to Italy and Tahiti. Travel experts Nadine Nardi Davidson and Brad Butler are here to help you plan a memorable trip, whether it's your first time, a return trip, or your honeymoon. Great to have you back again today, Nadine. Thank you, it's great to be back. Well, Americans love Italy. I believe it's the most popular overseas travel destination for Americans, is that right? That's, somebody did a poll and they found out that the wish list of the most important country that people would like to go to was Italy, with good reason. I love Italy. I do too, and there's so much to see and to do there. Uh, one of the reasons it's so popular is it's a place that you can go to over and over again right. and never finish seeing everything yep. or eating all the wonderful <laughs> food, which is I tell you, you know, I don't often travel to places just for the food, but Italy is a place that I could go there just for the food and be happy. When I go, I try and lose five pounds before I go. <laughs> <laughs> Hopeless cause, I bet. Well, it is for me almost. At least. Yes, but you know what, there are ways if people want an active vacation, they can eat and still be active. For example, Cinque Terre is an area that a lot of people like to go to, uh -huh. like to hike, and this uh, is an area that's not maybe the place that you would visit the first time you go, mm -hmm. but it's an area where there's these little medieval towns, yes. five of them, Cinque means five in Italian, on top of a mountain. And what people traditionally do is they walk from village to village and then they eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, you know, save the best part for when you get right. there. But I, I actually drove that. I've been to those towns and um, and it's one hell of a drive too. I should have been walking. I recommend walking, not driving. <laughs> well, drive, there's no road. <laughs> there, there was a, road. Yeah, yeah, I think there's was, a train for right. those who can't really make the walk. But uh, for a lot of people, you know, that's the big challenge is to do that walk. And by the way, that's an excellent thing to do if you love to eat but you're afraid of gaining weight and you don't want to <laughs> miss any of the food, is to go on a walking tour of Italy because there are walking tours or bicycling tours that will plop you down in a certain area that you can cover and then eat without guilt. <laughs> <laughs> and I could, I'll tell you, I ate gelato, chocolato, and of course, pasta all over Italy and pizza because they have the, on the corners they have the, the like the little mm -hmm. vending carts and stuff and I was constantly all over Rome. Well, that's the one great thing about Italy is that from the smallest little tavola calda to the best restaurant, the food is great wherever you eat. And so there's something for everybody's budget. You can eat good food for a little money. Right, Whereas right. some countries, unless you go to the better restaurants, you're not going to get good food. Right. But that's not true of Italy. And that's one of the reasons people love people it. People love it. Yeah. So what would you recommend for those first timers, those people who haven't been there and want to plan that first trip and really make it special? Well, if uh, it's going to depend on how much time they have. But let's mm. say you have two weeks. For sure, Venice, Florence, and Rome. Mm, Unless yeah. you hate history and hate art. <laughs> and hate In which case, don't go to Italy that right. Uh, because, well, uh, there's other things to see, you know. But uh, for the first timer, Venice, because number one, it's like walking into a painting. Right. There's nothing in the world like that it. That is such a special city. It's a special city, and you want to see it before it sinks. sinks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because people have said to me, too, right. they hear about the floods and they wonder. And I got stuck in those floods. <clears throat> did you? Have you gotten stuck in the floods? I've not gotten stuck in a flood. But what did you do? Well, the summer that I went there, because apparently there's mm -hmm. like a rainy season or it's in the fall or something, but the summer I went a couple of years ago, it was actually um, out of season or they were having, mm -hmm. maybe because of the problems in the lagoon, I guess, which they've been working on. Um, so went out in the morning, it was fine, and coming back from the, went to Lido or the neighboring island, yes. came back, got stuck. I mean, it was started pouring rain and the water was coming up. I took my shoes off and socks, pulled up my pants yes. or rolled them up, and trudged through the water. It was raining. It was actually kind of cold at that point, and I was soaking, and I didn't, mm -hmm. the water didn't necessarily look completely clean, and it was kind of gross. There were people stuck in the middle of San Marco Square, like on little islands and stuff. They usually put planks <laughs> up for people to walk on. This yeah. usually happens in the winter if it's going to happen, yeah. and they do have a plan in place they've been working on for like nine years to to stop the flooding, but I, I don't know if it's going to be successful. Bring your umbrella and your galoshes, <laughs> right. your, uh, your hiking boots or something. Well, like most people would say, well, then I won't go in the winter, but I have to tell you, there's something really magical about Venice in the winter, mm -hmm. even though it might be a bit foggy, because if foggy. you go during carnival, you're going to see it when a special magic grips the city. When oh, people is it a costume kind of carnival? Ca car mask oh. and oh. costumes and everybody has these funny headdresses on and they walk around the streets in the mask and they're blowing on things. And if you're lucky enough to go to some kind of a party, 
you know, then they really go all out in costumes and champagne and these beautiful oh. palazzos, and you feel like you're back in the Renaissance time or medieval times. It Actually, I think I heard about those. Uh -huh. I didn't see them, but I think when I was there, I took the tour of the palace, mm -hmm. and I think they said that the doge or whatever you called the guy at the yeah. time, the king or their ruler, leader, um, the reason they started holding those, I think they said, or at least one of the reasons mm -hmm. was that um, he liked to get out and mingle with the people, and he could mingle probably especially with the female people, if he was in disguise. Right. And so those, that was actually very popular because it was a way for him to get out and... I think people get <laughs> away with a lot of things yeah. when they're behind a mask. But I have a, a, for example, just this one photo I could hold up and show you like what um, some, oh. how elaborately they, some people do get dressed there for the Can we get a close-up on this one? Yeah. And uh, now, okay, so we got... Now, what did you go dressed as? That's what I want to know. Um, I just wore a mask because I was there as a visitor and I didn't come totally prepared. <laughs> but I'll, we had a wonderful feast, wonderful dinner, and a beautiful Renaissance palazzo. That in, and I felt like I was stepping back in time. Um, what other city? Time. I mean, so few cities. I mean, you need a boat. You don't need a car. You need a boat. That is such a special city. Well, boats can cost you, though. <laughs> you have to remember. <laughs> Venice is very magical. You want to go, but you want to save your money before you go for the gondola ride. Because what used to the first time I ever took a gondola ride in Venice, it was seven dollars for an hour, oh. and now it's more like a hundred and twenty dollars for forty minutes. And uh, you know what I did? I took the water taxi. Oh. <laughs> well, that's still expensive, you know, the water taxis. You have various degrees. You have the Vaporetto, which is the cheapest, more like the public uh, water taxi. Oh, the, and then the, you the, have the bus. Yes, the bus. The bu and okay. then you have the private water taxi, mm. which costs more like a taxi would, e except more in Venice. And um, then, of course, you also can take a gondola ride, which would be the most expensive, but also the slowest. And, um, but if he sings, who cares, you know? <laughs> right. And I guess you have to yeah. take at least one gondola ride you in do. Venice. You do, you do. So well, the reality of traveling to Italy today is that the euro is like a dollar 39, uh, yeah. almost a dollar 40. And I so, remember the good old days yeah. when it was even. Remember <laughs> right. that? Or yes. when it was in the dollar's favor? Right. Not anymore. So what one thing people have to keep in mind when they go is they're not going to get they have to kind of trim back their expectations because if you're used to going to uh, getting a five-star hotel for $350 a night, that's going to cost you more like 650 wow. in Venice. And if they're used to having just, say, an average hotel, that's still going to cost you 250 to $300 probably. Wow. But that's the reality of the euro in Europe, but primarily in Italy. It's even higher. Well, just uh, make sure you enjoy that trip then. I don't know. <laughs> you can well, eat cheap. I don't know. Take the ramen noodles and uh, um, stay in a nice hotel and have the ramen noodles. I don't know. Maybe that's the answer. Forget well, the, you the don't pasta. Well, you don't have to stay in the best hotels, but you're going to cut back. If you're used to staying in them, then you might have to cut back your expectations to stay in your budget. Hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and then, of course, there's Florence would be also an important place to go on your right. first visit. Right. Not only do you have a Renaissance city of Michelangelo and, uh, and Giotto and all of the important people of the Renaissance, but you have great shopping, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is all, yes, and the designer shops are going to be very expensive. Yeah. But Italy, of course. There's clothes, also yeah. the flea market around the corner where you're more apt to find a bargain, and you will find the most beautiful shoes and the most some of the most beautiful jewelry you'll ever see. So you don't want to cut out Florence besides the art. But one thing I would advise people uh, that didn't used to be necessary, but now that Italy is so popular, you should get your tickets to the art gallery, the, the Uffizi mm. Art Gallery, which is the most important art gallery, and the Academia, which is where the Michelangelo's David is. Those are two places, especially if you're going in the summer, that you really want to buy your, have your reservations and buy those online or through a travel no, agent or whatever um, in advance. Otherwise, the lines are so long that you'll waste a lot of your precious mm. vacation time standing in line. I just remember I heard get there early, and I remember I got there really early in the morning, too. Is that? Um, that could be true, but I'm not sure what time it opens. Um, Book it online. I think, I think you're safer with a reservation, especially if it's May through September, I would we'll, say. We'll yeah. be right back.
And we are back with Nadine Nardi Davidson today to helping you plan that trip to Italy. Okay, so what have you got for us next? Well, we were talking about the most important things to see on your first trip. Rome, obviously. Most important Beautiful thing, city. don't cut your, sh your time short in Rome. Right. You need well, four days or more. <laughs> I could have, I spent six months, but six months, six months I lived in Italy oh, wow. and it wasn't enough to see everything. But to be Probably realistic, my favorite city in, in Italy, you think. can always find more things to see in Rome. Important thing also is get a tour to the Vatican in, and plan it in advance if you can, because it's another place that's hugely popular Crowded. to the Sistine Chapel. Crowded. You can see St. Peter's on your own, but the Vatican Museum and the Sistine Chapel, the lines are horrendous, and you want to make sure that you have an inn in advance to make sure you don't spend all that time in line again. And it allow enough time, that's all I can say, so that you don't be fr so you're not frustrated that you miss this and you miss that because from there's not only the old Rome of right, you know right. Roman times, yep. but there's the Renaissance Rome and then there's the modern Rome and there's great shopping and great eating of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you pasta. like the shopping. <laughs> I like the shopping and I love the pasta and all the eating too. But um, then there's other places if you have more time to move on to. I would then recommend the Amalfi Coast. Capri is, you die and gone to heaven. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have a photo, if we have time, sure, of sure. Positano on the Amalfi Coast, which is another very favorite honeymoon place. And I have driven the Amalfi Coast, I want to say, by the way, and that is one hell of a drive. <laughs> Beautiful drive. But. So if you can easily take a ferry between Positano and Capri, and so it's one great place for honeymoon couples to go. Um, it's a great place if you're celebrating your anniversary and you want to start out with an area that's more romantic and then maybe hit some of the cities. Or let's say you're into cooking. You can take a cooking class right there in Sorrento area and then go over to Capri and the Amalfi Coast. And I'm ready. Let's go. Six let's months. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, this is welcome. Nadine Nardi Davidson. Nadine's book is Travel Without Other With Others Without Wishing They Had Stayed Home. Up next, we're going to take you to Tahiti. Take a look at this. Okay. Joining me now is Brad Butler. He's a spokesman for Tahiti Vacations. We were just taking a look at some footage from your pre-wedding honeymoon. Is that it? That was it. That was it. it was a pre-wedding honeymoon. We figured, okay, let's do the honeymoon first, just in case things don't work out. In case. Well, at least you got the trip. <laughs> right. I mean, well, that was actually your wife in the water with the. I'm yeah. sorry, your wife to be fiance. What am I saying? Right. In, in, the wife the, to be the betrothed. Um, and yeah, she was wrestling with the stingrays. That was off Morea which is a main island off, just off the big island of Tahiti, the main island of Tahiti. And that was on like a lagoon picnic, what they do. Uh -huh. And you go first, uh, after you get on the boat, you go uh, swim with sharks. They swim these, with the sharks? Yeah, they have these black tip reef sharks, which are supposed to be not aggressive. Uh, supposed, supposed to be. Right. And, and are they? they? Well, they, they, they get them fed, right? And they get them swirling in a bunch. There's like 20 or 25 of them. And then you get in the water uh -huh. and you hold onto the anchor rope on the boat and they swim <laughs> all around. And you do this for about 20 minutes. Then you jump back in the boat and then you go to the stingray spot. And the water is about four and a half feet deep, and you stand there, and then they give you the raw fish to feed the stingrays. Uh, and nobody gets bitten or No, eaten no, or the stingrays, they know the drill. You know, they know it's feeding time. And, and uh, the sharks, too, right? The sharks. Uh, apparently, apparently. Okay. They, they look at you askance, and some of them are big. But And then after the stingrays, you go to lunch off a of motu, which is a small island in Tahitian. And then they give lunch, and you can snorkel in this beautiful lagoon oh, bet, that's yeah. huge. And uh, you stay there for a couple hours, and it's a great tour on Morea. Great place for a honeymoon? 
It is. Well, it is a very popular place, uh, Tahiti in general, uh, for all types of people. Uh, the tourism in Tahiti is mainly, it's a, about 35% uh, um, American, <laughs> about 35% uh, European, uh -huh. and then the rest is split up, uh, J Japanese, Chinese, Asian, uh, kind of split up, and uh, the Japanese very much loved the honeymoon there. And, you know, we <laughs> met a lot of honeymooners. How long is the flight from the West Coast? Well, and actually, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't know, and I didn't know when I booked it, was it's eight hours from Los Angeles, oh. nonstop flight. Closer than Europe. Uh, absolutely. And when, uh, also, it's the same time zone as Hawaii. So it's just south of Hawaii. It's by the equator. And uh, they say it's halfway between, um, you know, Los Angeles to Australia is Tahiti. And so for the West Coast people, it's a very easy flight. Now, if you're on the East Coast, mm -hmm. it takes a little, it's going to be, uh, especially with stops and whatnot, right. it's going to be a f 18 hour ordeal, but it's, it's, it's very easy. And Air Tahiti Nui was what we, we flew and it was, it was fantastic. It was very easy. You generally get there in the evenings. That's when the flights generally arrive. And then you take the puddle jumper uh, either to Bora Bora. A lot of people, s they have planned vacations, they stay one night mm -hmm. uh, in Tahiti at Papiete, and then you go to Morea or Bora Bora or, or wherever. Okay. We'll be right back. with Brad Butler today telling you all about Tahiti. Well, this is the classic photo I always think of for Tahiti really? with these huts over the water. Absolutely. And that's at the Sheraton Hotel on Morea, right off uh, off Morea or on Morea, as they say. Now, of course, that's the picture you, that's the place you want to stay. And did you stay there? Well, we didn't, we had a beach bungalow mm. at a, a more family oriented, a smaller hotel that we like a lot. Uh -huh. And now the Sheraton, it's a beautiful resort. We went there. Now, these particular ones you just showed have a glass, they have this beautiful balconies and they have a glass um, uh, underneath the coffee table in the living room it's there's glass, glass with the and the lights come on in the evening and the fish are attracted to it so you're sitting there in the wow, evening so you can see yeah the, the fish, fish are, are all around you know and you're having your champagne don't even need the submarine well you and just. and those are so beautiful that those bungalows are dark wood and they have the European bathtub the huge European bathtubs and it's just an amazing place and that's that is the, probably the best resort Ex to stay in expensive yeah, the overwater bungalows can average out at about seven hundred to a thousand a night, okay, depending. So the budget travelers may not be going. Well, those, you'd so. be surprised though. You can, especially you know, one of the things about Tahiti is if the weather doesn't change that much in the off season for us, it's you know, hot, cause, hot right? Because <laughs> it's the summer down there uh, when our it's our winter. But of course, uh, the Americans don't travel in the winter to places like that. But if you went down there, you could get some good deals. Mm -hmm. And now if you look into, through your travel agent or whatever, you can get great all-inclusives where you had stay at a few different places. And you'd really be surprised that you could probably snag a couple nights at a place like that in a, you know, a package deal. How much time do you need for a first visit? Well, we stayed there for two weeks, mm -hmm. we, and we wanted to make sure that when we got there, we could relax and do what we wanted. Now, the thing about when you go, the, the two main places that people go to in Tahiti is Morea and Bora Bora. Mm -hmm. Now, Morea is called the most beautiful island in the world, right. and Bora Bora is called the most beautiful lagoon in the world because it's like an atoll where it's, it's an old volcano, and it's got the in the center, so everything, all the hotels are around the lagoon. So do you agree with that, by the way? I, I think it's definitely true. And Bora Bora is beautiful, but it's more busy. And one of the things with the difference between Bora Bora and Morea is, if you want to save a few dollars and you're staying in Morea, you're not trapped in your hotel, like in the resort, where you have to buy their food and buy their drinks. On Morea, there's little stores all around the island, and you can buy little foodstuffs so that you can economize a little bit and then spend big on dinner. 
And so that's the better part of Morea is it's, you know, more budget conscious, but you also have the luxury of going to a lot of different resorts around the island. Uh -huh. And did you do all the, you know, snorkeling and... A lot of snorkeling. Of and most of the hotels have snorkeling right outside. You go outside, you're to the beach, and there's beautiful snorkeling. And the water's 80 degrees, and it's clear, crystal clear. And you just jump in and, and go. And we did a lot of snorkeling. And, of course, you can, if you're a scuba diver, there are the, the day trips mm -hmm. and whatever. And if you go in October, there's whale watching, which you can go. And uh, one of the tours we took was the dolphin watching. And the guy told us, you come down here in October and I'll get you in the water with whales and you'll pet them and you will, you know, big whales. So well, it is swimming with the sharks, you might as well swim with <laughs> the whales too. You know, <laughs> exactly. I would love to do that. And it's just such, the, you know, the light and the space is it's just incredible. You just are amazed at what you're seeing at every turn. It's the rainforest, it's the beach, it's, you know, it's just one beautiful sight after another. Is there a lot of partying going on? You know, <laughs> one of the things is it's so beautiful there, and it gets light at 6 a.m., and it gets dark at 6 p.m., and you want to see so much, and the weather, it tends to be humid, a bit warm, so you're out going and going and going, and by the time it's 6, it gets dark, you have a little dinner, maybe a couple of drinks, you're kind of wiped out, mm -hmm. and so a lot of times you kind of cash it in early. There is some clubs there. We went to some jazz night spots. Uh, there are places that there is a lot of fun to party, but it's not as raucous as, as you might think. And of course, you have a lot of people who are on their honeymoon, so they're not exactly looking to go out and party. With they already them. found somebody. Right, exactly. <laughs> So, but it sounds too like it was very active, though. It wasn't just yes. being a beach bum and just soaking no. up the sun. You were absolutely there's a, there's a lot to do. There's uh, all kinds of things to do, and of course you can go to the Polynesian shows, um, in different hotels and whatnot. So there and there's music around town. One of the things on Morea is the restaurants will all pick you up at their hotel. So if you don't have a car, you call up the restaurant, they come and they get you, they take you to the restaurant, and then they cart you home afterwards. Because it's only 40 miles around on the island, so it's 15 minutes from everything. You know, Bora Bora, it's pretty much the same. Now, is there a rainy season there? It is. It's in our winter time. Okay. Now, it's from what I understand, I was talking to the locals, it's, you know, Janu you know, maybe December, January, it alters a little bit, and it does rain pretty hard. Okay. But they said, you know, you'd be surprised. You come here, you know, during uh, you know, November, and you can get great weather. And they're trying to promote more of getting Americans down there by, you know, offering better deals during those off-season. Off yeah. Because I went to Singapore once during rainy season, mm -hmm. and we were landing, and I thought, so this is a monsoon. Right, <laughs> exactly. We, we got there right after it had rained for four days straight. Wow. So we got really lucky with the weather. And, you know, when you're sitting out there with those huge thunderheads out in the distance, it, you know, it's really the sunsets are so fantastic. Are there also, what do you get, hurricanes or cyclones or typhoons or anything? Uh, yeah, but it's very rare. It's very rare. It's, Tahiti is so much in the middle of nowhere that nothing really major really goes down in that area. When you get those t uh, cyclones, they're more, you know, in the China Sea or, you know, towards the, the Asian mainland. You know, so you don't get that way out there. You know, I'm just curious, when you mentioned, now, I th I th again, I think these bungalows look very mm -hmm. beautiful, but after the tsunami, um, you know, is there, do they have a problem with, well, do you be <laughs> careful if you're staying in the well, States? As a matter of <laughs> fact, when we were down there, there was an earthquake uh, somewhere in Indonesia, and there was a tsunami warning, you know, so I was uh, kept expecting something. Because obviously, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a beach bungalow or if you're just in your hotel on the beach. Right. If there's a tsunami, you know, you're going to have something to deal with. Uh, but they don't, I've never heard much uh, of that, you know. Now, one of the things that, um, that's interesting about Tahiti is they deal with the, they have the Frank. You know, French, oh. it, it was a French colony, so it's French Polynesia. So then switch to the Euro. No, and in fact, yeah, when, the, in fact, France gives them $20 billion a year in aid. Wow. And they were pressuring them to adopt the Euro. And I, the locals I was talking to, the tour operators and whatnot, they said, we resisted because, first, we don't want to be beholden to France and Germany, who are the big powers in Europe, in terms of their currency and our currency. And second, we have pride in our own currency. So it's, it can be expensive, you know, 
uh, down there for well, basic things. Thank you very much, well, Brad. Thank you. I'm ready to go. I want to check okay. out these bungalows. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.